Production facilities for Arts Insight provided by Film Biz Recycling, a nonprofit prop shop creating socially responsible and sustainable solutions from media industry waste. From Brooklyn, New York, where obsessive compulsive is not repulsive, it's Arts Insight with Andrew Gadoni. Tonight, music journalist and author Stacey Giraseva. Insight. I'm Andrew. Here on the show, we crimp in there, Liz. Yeah, Here on the show, we feature some of New York's finest neighborhood talent mm -hmm. from all five boroughs of New York City, and I am so glad you could join us tonight. Hi, Liz. How are you? Good. How is your Brooklyn neighborhood this evening, Andrew? My Brooklyn neighborhood is fine. Everything in your neighborhood. Everything is just dandy. That's gorgeous. It's, it's like Sesame Street. Oh, Not really. Not really. I mean, no. you know. There's uh, the random looting and violence and people getting robbed and stuff. Pandemonium. And and rich people getting stuck up for their peace or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have no for idea. For their peace. Yeah, for their jewelry piece, that is. Not not, not their not their uh, iron in their pocket or anything. Park Slope getting confused. We're, we're, we're making our crew I giggle. I am pleased to introduce tonight's guest. Uh, she is a prolific music journalist and author now living in Borham Hill in Brooklyn. She came from what was then the Soviet Union to the Boogie Down at the tender age of six back in 1981, and since then has soaked up her cultural surroundings, which have helped influence her writing about hip hop and music in general. She was editor in chief of Russell Simmons' One World Magazine, and most recently, managing editor of Billboard Magazine, annual awards issue. She's profiled music stars such as Erica Badu, The Roots, Chuck D, and the late Aliyah, to name a few. Her work has been published in magazines the likes of Vibe, Interview, Double XL, and Village Voice. She's best known for her book, Def Jam Inc., published by Random House in 2006, which chronicles the legendary music label that launched the careers of LL Cool J, the Beastie Boys, Public Enemy, and countless other artists. Her second book, A Work in Progress, is an autobiography on her growing up and living in the Bronx among the community of Soviet expats. Well, it's a pleasure to have her on the show. Please welcome Stacy Garaseva. Camp Sunny, as it's called, is only 40 miles from our highly protected Soviet compound in Riverdale, the Bronx, but far enough away that it inhabits another dimension of space and time. It's the only place where our Soviet kids in New York City are able to break rules and live against the grain, if only for one short month out of the year. We can wear what we want, dance to whatever music we choose, sneak out of our rooms in the night and go on adventures while the counselors sleep. The rigid constraints of school life are loosened, and though we're still watched, there are too many of us, children, and not enough of them, adults, to keep up with all of our misbehaving. The air is different here, electric, like the fence that stretches around our property, separating us from the rich Americans on the other side. They're the kind referenced in the movie Wall Street, when a broker name drops his Long Island property. Can't complain, got a house in Oyster Bay. They keep stables of horses that we secretly feed carrots to the fence. They watch us out of pensive dark eyes, flanked by long eyelashes, snorting out of large fuzzy nostrils, tapping their muscular legs on the dirt ground. We are fond of those horses, maybe because we can relate to them, confined like us. In our minds, we have freed them from their rich masters and are running with them. And it's within the confines of this electric fence, all of us cohabitating under one roof for 30 days and nights, that my crush on Chandra accelerates with the speed of a bullet. Chandra is like a tween dream, like a Corey Haim, Mackenzie Aston, and Will Wheaton all rolled into one. He has perfect blonde hair with side-swept bangs that fall just below his eyebrow. His look is equal parts skater and surfer. He wears Nike high tops with the laces loose, OP shorts, and long t-shirts that hang perfectly on his lanky frame. He is not like our Russian boys. They have nothing on him. 
But alas, I'm powerless to divert his attention away from Queen Beatrice, who is 14 years old, going on 20, and possesses an effortless kind of cool that can't be learned or, imit or imitated, the kind that simply oozes out of her naturally. Everyone at camp seems to fall under her spell, including Shandor. But Beatrice likes older, more experienced guys, like Zelinov, the camp slut, who is best friends with Lyubomidrov, a tall, blue-eyed blonde who resembles the lead in The Princess Bride and has my good friend Asya as his eye. But Lyubomidrov gives mixed sig signals, so Asya moves on to Chris, a Polish kid who is not that attractive. His face is always red, earning him the nickname Pig Face, but good enough for that month. And so it goes, Asya pining for Lyubomidrov, Shandor pining for Beatrice, and me pining for Shandor. I know I don't stand a chance with him and I'm forced to stuff down my crush in hopes that the following summer things will turn in my favor. And indeed, in the summer of 1988, Ava and Shandor returned to camp, much to my profound excitement. But this time there's no Beatrice to distract Shandor away from me. She's gone back to Hungary, where she will surely be, where she will surely be breaking more hearts. Pour Some Sugar on Me by Def Leppard becomes our new sex anthem. The scenario is the same. I lie on the beach, crisping under the sun, rewinding the track over and over on my beloved Sony Sports Walkman. I'm hot, sticky, sweet, from my head to my feet. Yeah, I lip sync along. Shandor is a little older now, and so am I, with fresh gear to back up my new chic sensibilities and maturity. There's an acid wash denim skirt paired with my favorite t-shirt, Club Spuds, featuring the Budweiser mascot, Sp Spuds McKenzie in a Hawaiian shirt. I accessorize with peace sign earrings, cat sneakers, and not one, but count them, two swatch watches on my left wrist. One has a clear band and face which displays all the machinery inside, which is just about the most awesome swatch anyone can own. I feel cooler still thanks to my best friend Ava. Once again, the absence of Beatrice provides an opening for us to bond. Together, I'm sure we're the most envied duo at camp. I take my fashion cues from Ava, as well as English lessons. Her English is infinitely better than mine. She's fond of adding the word period at the end of a sentence. She does it constantly, and I have no idea what it means. For instance, she will say, I like Coke better than Pepsi, period. I'm not in agreement wanting to be able to insert this mysterious period at the end of my own statements with the same effortless effortlessness as Ava does. Eventually, I do, hoping that I'm not sounding ridiculous. I think they're going to be serving ice cream cups at lunch today, period. I blurt out one morning at the beach. I'm certain that my close friendship with Ava will make me more attracted to her, other, to her brother Shandor, but as the days go by, my interaction with him remains limited and awkward. He passes by me in hallways, and on the grand staircase, we bump into each other in the TV room, and each time, I scramble for, for the perfect thing to say. But all that comes out is, hey, released with the weight of some kind of confession. He says hey back and I grab onto that single word with a lingering hope that it would next time grow into a full sentence, an actual dialogue, but it never does. With the days clicking by, I decide to take a more aggressive approach. I will need to get a clear answer from Shandor. Does he like me or not? Because these hays are not telling me anything. So I give Ava firm instructions one night. Before tomorrow, ask Shandor how he feels about me. Some agonizing half an hour later, she comes back with the answer. He said he likes you 80%, she tells me. 80%, is, is that good? What is the other 20? Repulsion? Depressed and confused, I slither away upstairs to the room I share with 20 other girl campers, pull out the Pringles chips I've been saving, and eat away my confusion. Maybe this rejection is karma's way of paying me back from turning away Sasha P. two years earlier. It was winter session of 1986, and Sasha was the son of our math teacher. Short and dark-haired. He wasn't particularly handsome, but there was something about him, something that made me want to look. And he would look, too, during our morning camp meetings, called Lineka, when the entire camp gathered in one large room to go over an agenda for the day, which usually involved some kind of patriotic, communism-centered activity. There's no opportunity for contact during those meetings. It was later, after dinner, during the dances, that things would start to take shape. The dimly lit room... Girls on one side, boys on the other, pressed against the wall, was a microcosm of preteen lust, hormones raging, scarcely an adult in sight. Her libido was supplemented by the soaring ballots that permeated the 80s. These heart wrenchers seemed to be designed to ignite epic slow dancing. The dramatic opening chords of I just died in your arms to tonight by the cutting crew would eject you off the wall instantly and command you towards your crush of the night. 
You would approach him or her, her without saying a word and just stand there waiting for approval or rejection. Then, depending on your age, you would dance either very close together or about a foot apart. By age 10, we're dancing in full body contact and braces. The girls would drape their arms around the boys' necks, the boys would clasp theirs tightly around the girls' waists, and we would rock side to side like this, a moment of total intimacy. The songs had to have a kind of unisex appeal. That's why you'd never hear any Debbie Gibson at one of our slow dances. They also had to be of ample length, preferably over five minutes, which was the ideal amount of time to get closer to your crush. These epic ballads included Still Loving You by Scorpions, Hotel California by The Eagles, I'll Be There For You by Bon Jovi, which clocked in at almost six minutes with some heavy statements like, When you breathe, I want to be the air for you. If timed perfectly, you could be breathing into your partner's ear just at that moment, creating undeniable romance. Then there was Foreigners, I Want to Know What Love Is, with lyrics that open with, going to take a little time, a little time to think things over. It was clear that you didn't just ask anybody to dance to a song like that. The selected one was special. And it was during Nikita by Elton John, one of my favorite jams, that I found a grinning Sasha standing in front of me, asking me to dance without saying a word. I accepted by peeling myself off the wall and following him to the dance floor. We danced silently, but in a silent that clamored with meaning and longing and questions as Elton wailed about his impossible love with a Russian guard, the sound of the music secondary to the symphony of emotions in our young hearts. There were dreams and fears in there, anticipation and curiosity, freedom and restraint. As soon as that dance was done, Sasha was inviting me again. By the fourth dance, I couldn't take the heaviness of his advances and ran back upstairs to the girls' room and hid. Sasha wants to know if you're coming back to the dances, a girl entered the room. Apparently he had sent her with the message. She seemed to want to play matchmaker and stood there for a few minutes, telling me how awesome Sasha was and how she'd give him a chance. No, I won't be coming back there tonight, I said with annoyance. My decision was final. She left, and I could hear the music from the dance floor. But now, instead of beckoning me, it was my signal to keep away. But Sasha had not given up on his pursuit and had devised a new strategy. The next day, he began sending me letters to my room, delivered by a boy from my grade, the only one he trusted with his deepest thoughts. The letters were sincere and rather mature for a 13-year-old. They were written neatly, and he spoke of us, us together. I read them as the rain beat loudly against the windows and then responded coldly and differently. He would write back with questions that de desperately tried to unravel my immature preteen mind. Finally, I sent him one last reply, and this one was short. I would like to end this communication now. At the end of the day, during our final Linneka, he was no longer staring at me. When I looked his way, his eyes would not catch mine and then dart away as they had before. He simply did not look at me at all. Very, very quickly after my rejection of him, Sasha paired up with Anya T, a girl from my grade with wild blonde hair and a low and feminine voice. Back at school, I would see them making out in the hallways, and though I didn't want to admit it to myself, it made me a little jealous. Sometime later, Sasha and I found each other back at camp, back at the dances. I stood in the dark room and wondered if he would ask me to dance again. I wanted, him, I wanted him to. I had reconsidered him. And he did ask. We danced this time to Make It Real by the Jets, a group of about seven siblings that all looked creepily alike. I loved you. You didn't feel the same. The woman sang softly over a synthesized melody. Give me one more chance to make it real. And at that moment, the desire seemed to return, but just for a moment. As soon as the song was over, it was clear that there would not be another chance for us. And Shandor, he returned back to Budapest that summer, taking his 80% liking of me with him and any hopes of reclaiming the remaining 20. All that was left to do was look forward to the next camp session, the next crush, the next dance, and new arms for me to die in. Welcome to the show, Stacy Guraseva. Welcome to the show, Stacy. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure Andrew. to have you on. And um, I enjoyed what you read. Tell me a little bit about it. So this was um, um, an, a, a shorter, a short excerpt from a, a larger chapter that's about um, this camp that uh, we had growing up in the '80s. It was a special Russian camp, um, uh, summer camp, but we also had it uh, during the winters. And it was all the kids that went to our special Soviet school in Riverdale, in our compound. Take me a little bit back to those times, because yes, you had the, you know, you, you had the enclave community, um, very sort of tight-knit, 
mm-hmm. um, sort of to themselves, I would guess. Did, did they allow you to leave, I mean, and go and see other cultures? And how did this sort of become the, uh, the impetus for uh, wanting to pursue and wanting to write about music and things of that mm-hmm. nature? Well, to answer your first question about as far as what, uh, we're, where we were allowed to go, uh, we were restricted to a 25-mile radius, Beyond that, we had to get special, like, written permission. We had to go to the Soviet mission in Manhattan and get a special permission to travel outside of that. So within the 25 miles, which, you know, you know, we could go to Manhattan, we, could, we had a car, we could drive and go to Manhattan, but children always had to be chaperoned. They, they always had to be in the presence of an adult. We lived out, my family and I lived outside of the compound as, as a decent number of, of other Soviet families did because they couldn't fit everyone in there. And, you know, so we were always observing things all the time, you know, just in our surroundings and and the kids. And even though it was Riverdale, which is not like the the scary, like, 80s Bronx that people think of, it was still an urban environment. So we still saw uh, a lot of the urban culture. And one of my very early memories was when we just got here, which was 1981, being six years old, my sister and I, I have a twin sister, we, uh, we went to our playground and I just remember these girls playing double dutch. And it was such a, to me, that's such a quintessential memory of like New York, like early 80s New York and that urban environment. And just, I remember watching them like jump through that rope with like speed like I, I hadn't seen. And as they're jumping, they're also reciting rhymes. Like there, it was, it was, it was verbal and it was physical and it was all those things and so you know we're always picking up these visual little moments you know as we we got into the late 80s and early early 90s that's when i remember really uh, you know making friends with kids that lived in the city and travel going there more and um and of course some tv played a really a really crucial crucial part in our exposure the 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 really like important show that that exposed my sister and I to to hip hop um culture was Video Music Box yes of course which um Uncle Ralphie yeah Uncle Ralph and that that was such a re- that was always such a revelation for us later on in life how did this translate into a career in music journalism if you will mm-hmm. Well, I became uh, interested in writing um, as a potential career, like freshman year in college, which was 93. And, and it, there was just a synergy happening in terms of what was uh, taking place in music and then in my, my interest in writing. And basically, it just kind of merged because in the early 90s and mid, into going into mid-90s, there's just a lot of exciting things happening in hip hop. So you know, I became a fan of that of that music and that culture, and simultaneously, I became interested in writing, specifically like journalism, reporting, and then I thought, well, why not write about music? And and I just went for it and got internships and wrote for local papers and did like album reviews and then eventually features, and um, just kind of snowballed from there snowballed into some pretty big things. I mean, certainly your roster of, uh, you know, interviewed music stars is not too shabby at all, <laughs> which is uh, which is great. You've met, met many people who've probably come and gone. But mm. uh, in that, what do you think is interesting about why are musicians interesting subjects to interview? Mm. And uh, why are record labels even more fascinating as evidenced in this book here? <laughs> well, because... As fans of the music, we always want to know who's behind the music, basically. You know, like the show, behind the music. It's like, it's kind of a natural uh, desire to know, to get to know the personalities. And so, and also because they're accomplished and because they're creative, they're, they're inspiring. So we want to learn from them. But it's not just the artists. To me, all the, the people behind, behind the scenes are also fascinating. You know, like uh, say Rick Rubin, who is, you know, not necessarily you know, like an artist, but he's a producer, he's a well-known producer and and executive. Um, To me, he's an incredibly fascinating subject because his, um, you know, 
his accomplishments are immense. We have your book here, Def Jam Inc. It's sort of the compendium to all things Def Jam. Well, tell us about the book for those who don't know Def Jam Inc. Why was the label Def Jam so instrumental in hip hop? Well, in a way, Def Jam was the label that really put hip hop on the map, like on a mass scale because they had so many big artists like LL Cool J, Beastie Boys, Public Enemy. Um, you know, they really broke hip hop to a mass audience. But what makes them so unique is that they were very successful in the 80s. But unlike a lot of their sort of, you know, competitors or fellow hip hop labels like, um, like Sugar Hill Records and, and um, even Tommy Boy, they stayed they stayed relevant. They've managed to keep the brand relevant and strong through the 80s, through the 90s, through the 2000s, and even into today. They started, you know, when, when hip hop was starting, you know, and in an incredibly unique way, where literally out of a, an NYU dorm room was when Rick, as a 19 year old, was just starting to make the first, you know, the first records and, and putting his little logo on these, you know, 12 inches and getting them printed himself. And that's how small it started and what it's grown into. How did you gain access to their world? Mm -hmm. Well, I had already known Russell Simmons, who's one of the founders. Um, I, I knew him from One World Magazine, which I was the editor-in-chief of for about three years, um, late 90s into the early 2000s. And it was, uh, it was kind of, um, you could say, a boutique magazine in that um, it wasn't published by him, but he was the editorial director. So our staff, our staff was very small, and so, uh, but he was involved. He was quite hands-on. So because we were so small, we had very direct access to him. And, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings and, um, you know, provided me that, that personal, you know, access. And over the course of the, all those years, I... You know, I got to know him and we gained a rapport. We, we also kind of collaborated when he started 360 Hip Hop, uh, which was a, a website. Having him on board was sort of the first step and then Rick got on board and once, you know, the two founders were on board, that's when, um, you know, a lot of the other people agreed to participate. So based on your efforts, what things might us, the audience, not know about Def Jam, about the legendary label that you know and that you've put forth in your book? Well, a lot of people might not know just how sort of small and in a way kind of disorganized and kind of crazy it was in those days when they were on the outside. It was like they were doing really well. They had they had the Beastie Boys that uh, License Still came out in eight, late 86 and was like a success, an immediate success. And El Cool J was doing really well. Meanwhile, their office was located on Elizabeth Street in what's now known as Nolita, but back then it was a very, it was still kind of a rough uh, neighborhood downtown. And just all the craziness that went on in that space with like artists sleeping in the offices. And one time Slick Rick just walks in and he goes, what's up peasants? And he has a gun and he shoots it into the ceiling. And like, it's, it was just a miracle that it didn't, hit anyone upstairs. So it was that kind of chaotic, very, it was a chaotic, it was a chaotic environment. Let's talk about your latest effort, which is mm -hmm. the biography that you're working on now, which you delved into earlier in the interview and in, you know, in, uh, in your reading. Well, it's really about the eight years that I spent it within that compound that I had described. So we came here in 81 as Soviet citizens. Our father got a job at the UN, United Nations, and um, as Soviet citizens, w as soon as we landed, it was like we were immediately tied with a sort of like, I guess like, a, like this umbilical cord to our, to like the mother ship, which was our, our compound and remained tied to it for all, for those eight years. And in that very charged political climate where, you know, we were always aware that we're being watched from both sides. It was the, the Americans were watching us and our own government was making sure we were behaving. So that, so I go through those years, not necessarily in chronological um, fashion, but it's sort of vignettes of s stories of, of um, what it was like, t you know, in our school and interacting with, with um, 
the other side, the Americans, and kind of our, you know, interesting run-ins that we had, and also we would have these kind of like peace exchanges where we would go visit public schools in the area, and they would come to our school just completely wide-eyed, like they just landed on an alien planet because our school is like basically a replica of like a Soviet, what a Soviet school would look like with like portraits of Lenin everywhere yeah, and a Soviet flag flying. Meanwhile, we look outside of our window and we see like the Bronx landscape. So it was a really like, <laughs> Like, it was like living a double life in a way, you know, because you couldn't get close to Americans because they were the enemy and we were here only, we are supposed to be here temporarily for four years, that was the standard time, and then you went back to Russia and you just continued your life. But we ended up staying longer because the political climate started changing, our father's contract got extended, um, we just got lucky. So that's what the book uh, is going to delve into, just... Uh, the political stuff is going to delve into um, 80s New York because we, we were part of it. So we, ex we saw it and it's an interesting kind of nostalgic trip to that period in time. And the 80s and 80s references and all through the lens basically of, you know, a young girl growing up and, you know, discovering herself and kind of maturing and, and you know, like a um, coming-of-age kind of story well, that takes place in this unique, really unique environment. I'm fascinated by it, and certainly, uh, you know, it's not everyone's story, and it is yours. Yeah. And uh, to see it through your lens, through your eyes, is uh, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Um, we only get waves of hearing about the Cold War and things like that, like it only happened on television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your book proves Mm -hmm. Part of it was happening in our backyard, too. Yeah. And that's something. Mm -hmm. you know, it definitely is. Well, I wish you the best of luck with it. And certainly, if you want to find out more about Stacy's uh, appearances and readings, uh, where can they uh, go? Um, well, I have a website, defchembook.com, um, but then I also have stacywrites.com. Right, I remember so, that. Yeah. Well, good. Good. Excellent. We'll check both sides out. And um, it was a pleasure to have Thank you. So much, Thank Andrew. you so much, Andrew. Thank Stacey you. Stacey Garasave, everyone. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you for watching Arts Insight. Um, I want to thank you, the viewer, for watching. Make it a good one, and we'll see you on next week's show. Production facilities for Arts Insight provided by Film Biz Recycling, a nonprofit prop shop creating socially responsible and sustainable solutions from media industry waste.